Well, Dr. Susan, thank you so much for joining me again today. Thank you, Arlena. It's so good to be back. And we're doing round two. So uh, round one, we talked about, we got into it, we talked about your whole story. It was amazing. I was like buzzing after that conversation. I felt like um, you just had so many um, just juicy nuggets about recovery and insights and wisdom. So I highly encourage those listening to go back and listen to that one too. But today for those on the YouTube channel, I'm holding up the book of Bright Line Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin, and Free. And so we're going to get into it. I have so many notes and so many things I want to ask you about. Um, but just a quick recap, how did this come to you? So I was, let me just do the math real quick. Um, I was 19 years sober. And at that time in my recovery, so let me just paint the picture. I'll, I'll give like the couple sentence thumbnail for people who didn't hear the first um, thing. So um, my alcohol and drug addiction uh, took me down hard and fast as a teenager. I ended up, you know, a high school dropout, prostitute, crack addict, alcoholic, um, got clean and sober when I was 20. And then food addiction took over really fast after that. And I uh, ballooned up and just crossed over the border in, from overweight into obesity. So I was in my mid twenties living with obesity, uh, clean and sober though. And so I went back to college. I did community college uh, at San Jose city college, mm -hmm. and then went to UC Berkeley, started studying the brain. I was just really curious how brains, you know, work and how, they can get so far off the rails anyway. So uh, then I went on and got my PhD in brain and cognitive sciences. And my weight was climbing all this time. I was struggling with binge eating disorder, um, bulimia, uh, and just general uh, overeating. And uh, food was really, really problematic for me. I was doing different 12-step food programs um, well, one in particular back then, um, I did it in California. I did it in Rochester when I moved here for grad school and, uh, it didn't work like, like, you know, the 12 step program for dr drugs and alcohol really just, you know, worked, but with food, you have to figure out what you're eating. It's, you don't have to, you know, engage with drugs or alcohol once you put them down. So I did finally find a 12 step food program that, gave me more prescriptive advice about exactly what and how much to eat. And my weight melted off. That was when I was 28. And I started food recovery as I know it um, then. So that was in 2003. So 11 years later, I was a mother of three little kids. I'd been married at that time for uh, 14 years. Uh, I was sober almost 20 years. And I was teaching a college course at that time. I was a psychology professor and I had tenure. I was teaching a college course on the psychology of eating. And in my morning meditation, what happened was, um, God told me to write a book called bright line eating. That's basically what happened. I mean, I had a really, really profound, intense spiritual experience in my morning meditation. Uh, and, I wrote about it in my five-year journal. So I know the date. It was January 26th of 2014. Uh, and I had a vision of this book uh, going out, getting written, going out into the world, um, me being on the Today Show and it, you know, hitting the New York Times list and uh and and impacting a lot of people. And in that meditation, I felt the prayers of so many people who were just drowning with their weight problem in food addiction, just, you know, not able to stop eating um, the way they didn't want to be eating anymore. And yeah, so I set about trying to write a book and get it published. And that's, that's basically the beginning of Bright Line Eating. That's beautiful. I know you hit the New York Times list. Did you also go on the Today Show? I did. <laughs> yeah. That's so yeah. cool. Listen, I have a manuscript back from my developmental editor and I'm like, okay, who knows? Who knows where this could go? <laughs> so, yeah. You never know. See, where, where were you when you, like, what was, 
Do you have like that moment in time of when you found out you hit the New York Times bestseller list? Sure. Yeah. I was in the basement of my house. Um, and I, I can't remember whether it was, uh, I think it was my publisher, uh, or maybe my agent who called me. Um, and I squealed and squealed and my mom was upstairs <laughs> making dinner, um, for our, for my kiddos and my family. And I ran upstairs and we jumped up and down in the kitchen and we squealed oh, and squealed and, and yeah. And, and then a week later, I remember calling a friend and saying, it's gone. And she said, what's gone? And I said, the the feeling of happiness, the boost in happiness that I got from hitting the New York Times list is completely gone. I'm back to my baseline level of happiness. And I was so fascinated by that because I used to teach a college course in positive psychology. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the hedonic treadmill where you're never actually going to get any change in your happiness levels by a change in circumstance, like, like hitting the New York times list. Like it'll lift you for a second, but then mm -hmm. it came, comes right back down. And uh, I thought it was fascinating that something I'd wanted so badly only lasted a week. Oh my gosh. I'm listening to all these podcasts right now. Do you know who Arthur C. Brooks is? No, I don't. Oh my God. He's a great, he was like a Harvard professor and he, anyway, he's a cool dude, older guy. And he was talking about happiness is like, it's a fleeting, it's a fleeting feeling. It's not like a really a state of mind. It's, it's very fleeting, but I am excited for you that you had that experience and I'm sure that you can, you know, congratulations. That's fucking amazing. So Thank you. there's that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I do want to talk about bright line eating. There was a couple things I didn't ask you ahead of time, um, but I, you know, did my research. I read the book and there was like a couple of highlights. It's a no exercise plan for your first year. Is that true? Uh, not for the, it's not for the first year. It's, I recommend that people don't start an exercise regimen while they're trying to start bright line eating. And the right. reason is that you want to get the food part automatic before automatic. And you need all the willpower you can muster to um, change everything about your way of eating. And so, you know, getting to the gym takes a lot of willpower. It also sets up what we call the compensation effect, right. which is uh, that justification of, oh, now I deserve, you know, a now I deserve. because <laughs> I, yeah, because I worked out four times this week. Right. And so um, yeah, you want to avoid the gym. Now, if you have a routine, like an already, existing, an existing automatic, mm. that's, that's like, like the sunrise, you know, I get up and I spend 20 minutes on the treadmill every day, you know, if it's absolutely automatic, then you can keep it, but also just no cognitive that, load. Yeah. If there's no cognitive load to it. But what I said no to is that it's not a year. It's okay. just until the bright line system is fully automatic which if yeah. you're really dedicated to it, maybe takes about four months, okay. but um, you also don't want to add in exercise while you're transitioning to maintenance. So however okay. much weight you've got to lose, make sure you land the plane at maintenance, meaning you've transitioned to your maintenance food plan. Okay. Um, uh, or if you have a ton of weight to lose, you can start losing weight, get your bright line eating system, fully automatic, and then start exercising while you still have some weight to lose. That's fine. And then just keep exercising regularly as you land to the plane at maintenance. You just okay. don't want to be adding exercise while you're trying to transition to maintenance. That's problematic. Okay. Yeah. That was, uh, um, uh, automaticity. I can't even say that. Automaticity. It's an important <laughs> word. Auto it really and then is. Automatizable. There's a good one yeah. too. Not everything is automatizable, like eating six times a day, like meals and snacks. That's not automatizable. Like yeah. if you if your dentist said you had to brush brush and floss your teeth six times a day, would you be successful with that? Like implementing <laughs> that long term? I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, 1200 calories a day. I saw that online, but I couldn't find it in the book. Maybe I missed it. Is that true? It's not a calorie based plan. So it okay. really depends False. on. Uh, yeah. I mean, as an average, that might be about right. Um, it depends whether you're on the higher protein plan or not. Okay. But it also depends on which, so, you know, bright line eating is a categories and quantities plan. So you're going to have one serving of protein for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in yeah. addition to other things. Right. And what are you going to choose for that protein? Like four ounces of non-fat cottage cheese or four <laughs> yeah. ounces of Italian sausage or, or cashews, right? Two ounces yeah. of cashews could also be, so your, your protein serving enough. could be 
70 calories or it could be 400 calories, right? right? Depending on what you choose. So you can't really say what the calorie amount will end up being. Okay. That's um, not the, that's not the yeah. thing. I know everyone's going to be like, okay, just tell me what the food is. But in the, in the beginning of your book, you're like, let's understand if, you know, you call them three critical processes. We we're going to talk about willpower gap, insatiable hunger, and um, overpowering cravings, which is different from insatiable hunger. Mm-hmm. I think those are the three things, right? Yeah. Okay. Totally. Those are the three things. Um, we're going to talk about emotional eating. Um, there's a quiz online. As soon as I saw mm-hmm. that, I dropped what I was doing and ran to the. Oh yeah. What what score are you? What what? Well, you get? unfortunately, it was the it's uh it was temporarily under maintenance. Oh yeah, the quiz is under maintenance right now. Don't. Yeah, it's under maintenance. So I was like, don't. But I will do. But I suspect after reading everything, I suspect I'm probably in the lower category. Like um, my whole life, I did not have a relationship with food. Like I didn't even think about it. It wasn't, and I'm going to ask you about hormones and menopause later um, when we talk about the food plan, because it changed for me. My relationship with food changed when I was in like my mid forties. Yeah. Anyway, there's all kinds of things I want to talk about. No bacon, no alcohol, <laughs> you know. hormones, uh, weight loss drugs. We'll touch on, uh, we'll talk about some criticisms. I think will be really important because I want to clear up some feedback that I got and breaking bright lines. I think that's important because it um, really spoke to like our humanness. Should we talk about the criticisms first? You want to? Yeah. Yes. Let's dive let's, right in there. Let's just get to it. Um, yeah. So when I, when I was going to interview your PR team reached out to me and I was like, Oh my God, absolutely. I would love to interview you. And then um, I took a picture of the book and posted it on Facebook. And I said, who's read this book. And I got a flood of responses. Um, most were like, and I know some people I didn't realize like 10 years ago, has it been over 10 years? No, not that long. This book was published. Brightline eating has been around nine years, but the book oh, was okay. published in 2017. So what is that? Seven years? Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't know, but seven I, and a half I, years ago. Yeah. yeah. I met a lady back home who had dropped a significant amount of weight. Like I had always known her. To, she was very tall. Uh, so she was like evenly distributed, but she was, you know, she's heavy, whatever. Um, and she like slimmed down and I was like, what are you doing? She goes, I found something that worked for me. She was like, basically no flour, no sugar. There's some other things, but come to find out she was talking about bright line eating. I, I, I bet, I bet she lost more than 50 pounds. Like, I don't know. I, I'm not one to ask somebody, how much weight did you, <laughs> it's not my get down, but, um, but yeah. So I, I was like, I didn't know that that's what it was. And she's been, um, uh, maintaining her weight this whole time. Yeah. Right. And so it there was really a works. lot, it was a lot of those. And then I was very surprised that some people I know from like the addiction recovery space, food coaches, who may or may not have ulterior motives. I don't want to question anyone's integri- integrity, but it just makes me wonder. They were like, oh, I've had clients who say that it triggered an eating disorder. And right. I was like, how is that? Is that, listen, I don't want to question anyone's experience, but what would you say to that? Yeah. So what I want to say is, um, there's some kernels of truth in that it's a yes. And kind of it's nuanced, right? So, Mm -hmm. um, first of all, weight loss at all can trigger an eating disorder, There it is, which puts you in a really tough spot. If you've got excess weight, you know, there's a lot of good reasons to lose weight, uh, Mm -hmm. 10 jillion health reasons and many psychological reasons and so forth, but losing weight can trigger an eating disorder, losing weight, uh, can, you know, calorie restriction, which is required for losing weight can trigger binge eating disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and also the bright lines are essentially food rules, right? Like no sugar, no flour, um, eating only at meals, not grazing or snacking, and then bounding the quantities of what you eat with a digital food scale. So if someone has a history of anorexia where they used to weigh and measure their food to make sure they only ate 300 calories or whatever, you know, um, then uh, the presence of these boundaries around food could uh, remind that part of them, the food restrictor part of them, um, 
of their eating disorder, right? So it could trigger them back into an eating disorder. Now there- so that's like, it's like a, it's like a cue, yeah, like the cue like trigger cue. response. Exactly, yeah. right, exactly. Right. Now, um, what's really important is to learn about the parts of ourselves, right? The, the food indulger part, the food controller part. And what we wanna be doing is working a bright line program or managing our food, however we do it from- the calm, clear, highest authentic self in us, Mm -hmm. not from one of these parts that has a perspective. So yeah, if we, if we don't, um, sort of stay aware to the food controller or food restrictor part of us that might get a little too excited by, oh my gosh, now we're gonna, we're gonna restrict our food more. I mean, here's the thing in bright line eating, we eat a lot of food. I mean, people's plates are mounding high with food people more often say it's too much food than it's too little food. Um, So someone would have to restrict uh, in ways that the Bright Line Eating program doesn't support um, to Mm -hmm. sort of go toward that eating disorder way. But there also are a lot of, um, there's a lot of confusion in the mental health professionals world around eating disorders because eating disorders in the DSM are still not teased out from food addiction and they often co-occur, but they're, but they are distinct. You can have both, but you can also have one and not another. So, um, a lot of clinicians are not really up on the latest research on the distinction between food addiction and an eating disorder. And so what a lot of clinicians think, because this is what they're taught in schools, this is literally, it's it's outdated, but it's still what's taught in schools is that um, any form of food rules at all is eating disordered or can lead to eating disorders Mm -hmm. and, um, and that food addiction doesn't exist, that food addiction is silly, that it's like air addiction or water addiction. You couldn't have such a thing that you need food to live. So food addiction doesn't exist, which is simply not true. Food addiction absolutely exists. If you have any common sense, everybody knows, like anyone with common (laughs) sense can clearly see difference. That food can be addictive. Absolutely. And it's, it's, yeah. And it's both a substance addiction, the sugar and flour and processed food part. And it's also a process addiction, like the, like right. gambling or sex, yeah, the process, eating itself. Yes. Right. So um, anyway, I just want to say that it is possible that people have been triggered into an eating disorder. Eating disorders get triggered all the time from all kinds of things, you know, from right, trauma, right. from a bad relationship, from whatever. Right. Right. Um, and certainly calorie restriction can do it, but also if you haven't worked with someone, I would recommend a practitioner who's, uh, experienced with internal family systems, which Mm -hmm. is the type of psychology where you learn about the parts of you Mm -hmm. to identify when a restrictor part is operating, right. And learn to talk to that part, learn how to, how to sort of keep that energy in check. Absolutely, it's possible that someone could take a no sugar, no flour boundary and start to, for example, restrict calories beyond what the Bright Line Eating program is right. suggesting. But I just need to say one more thing, which is Bright Line Eating actually has an incredible track record of helping people heal from eating disorders. Yeah. We have we have an eating disorders professional, uh, Dr. Joy Jacobs, who's a clinical psychiatry at UC San Diego um, and, uh, and has a practice filled with treating people with eating disorders. And she has become clear that for many people with eating disorders who also have food addiction, the standard treatment for eating disorders doesn't work because it requires them to eat donuts and muffins and cookies in quote unquote moderation and they can't do it. It triggers binging for Uh, them. Yeah. So she works with bright line eating to help people heal from the whole nut of, you know, eating disorders and food addiction at the same time. And oftentimes people with eating disorders find that nothing works for them until they come to bright line eating because- you know, standard eating disorder treatment just triggers their binging because they require eating sugar, which is ridiculous. Yeah, that is is so ridiculous. Yeah. I've, I've done, um, podcasts with, uh, I think his name is Mike Collins. He he wrote a book about, uh, sugar addiction. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yeah. 
Yeah. The sugar, man, the sugar gets a lot of us. The sugar gets a lot of us. Um, but yes. thank you for, thank you for clarifying that. And I really appreciate that. Um, I think I read somewhere that it sort of combines, you know, internal family systems, po positive psychology, 12 step. And it made so much sense to me as I was going through the book, I was like, wow, a lot of this, you know, we're going to get into some of the tools and things, but there's a lot of elements from that, that um, are required for healing addiction in general. Right. And so um, I was like, yeah, this is really powerful. I totally get it. So thank you for, thank you for clarifying that. And I, I would say to those people who feel like they've been triggered by it, that, you know, there's just more work to be done. It doesn't mean that I, I found this book, I was totally in agreement. Um, so there's other things going on there and that might need more, maybe specific, uh, like a specialist. Um, yeah. Support. I mean, there was a period of time in my journey where I, an eating disorder was kicked back up. So I have a history of bulimia and binge eating disorder and then when I started eating no sugar, no flour and weighing and measuring three meals a day, um, I lost all my weight really fast. And then I, and then I relapsed and my binging was worse than it had ever been in my whole life. It was like binging on steroids. It was horrible. Um, and I do think that some of that was an equal and opposite reaction to right. the structured way of eating I had been engaged in. It's like I had been really using a food controller part of me to keep the the structure in place and then when the structure collapsed the food indulger part of me you know took over and had a heyday right a field day so um i can absolutely understand someone who says hey i never binged before and now i'm binging all of a sudden what's the deal and i love what you just said it's like well yeah there's more work to be done and again you know, weight, weight loss is a trick. Like, you know, the brain really protects against weight loss. Even if you have weight yeah. to lose, to get healthier, the brain doesn't want you to lose it. And so, uh, it, it triggers all kinds of hormonal changes when you're losing weight. So you got to be really careful. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it's just, awesome. it's, it's a little bit of your damned. If you do damned, if you don't, if you have gained a bunch of weight, because losing it successfully and safely is hard. It is hard. And let's talk about why it's hard. Um, I was really interested um, to learn about the the willpower gap. And you had, um, you know, you talk about decision fatigue. There is this really interesting experiment done by Roy Baum, Baumeister. Baumeister, yeah. Baumeister, nice German name. Um, the cookie <laughs> experiment that proved that there was such a thing as decision fatigue. Do you want yeah. to tell me a little bit about uh, what the willpower gap in general, but the cookie experiment was so good. Yeah, the cookie experiment is basically where... Um, People are asked to show up to the lab to, to participate in a research study, and they're asked to show up at 10 a.m. and to be hungry, like you haven't eaten anything since dinner last night, right? So they show up hungry, and there's two conditions. Uh, half the people show up, and there's a bowl of washed radishes on the table, <laughs> and half the people show up, and there's a plate of freshly baked cookies mm. on the table, and they actually baked them in the lab with a little mini oven so that the room so smells, smells like cookies. Yeah, That's so mean. And then they're all asked to uh, fill out a long consent form that takes them like 15 minutes to fill out, and they're just asked to wait for the real experiment to begin. And they're t they're all told. Um, don't touch the food on the table, please, because it's for the next experiment. So right. the cookie people are having to withstand the cookies. The radish people are just having to not eat a bowl of radishes, which is not right. that hard. Take zero willpower. <laughs> yeah. And so after 15 minutes, they get brought in for the real experiment, which is uh, to, it's like an IQ test, but it's really what it is, is they're being asked to solve some insolvable geometry puzzles. And the the measurement is how long will they persist? And what they found was that the people who just withstood the cookies could could barely keep trying at these like impossible nine, eight puzzles. Minutes, nine minutes. Yeah. And whereas the radish people had all kinds of willpower to spare and they they persisted for all this long period of time because they yeah. had all their willpower intact. Yeah. So basically decision fatigue is a very real thing. And life yeah. is constantly wearing us down, whether it's that we're checking email and having to decide, do I reply, reply all, put a label on it, put it in a folder, delete it, save it, archive it, you know, and then you're going oh. through your whole inbox like that, which is depleting your willpower, or you're sitting in traffic and trying to be 
civil or your kids are climbing, you know, climbing on your legs and you're trying to be civil, you know, whatever you're just, you know, your partner's, you know, getting on your last nerve, whatever it is. And you're trying to regulate your emotions, your task performance, make decisions. And all of this is taxing the same little part of the brain about a couple inches back from the middle of the third eye of the forehead uh, called the anterior cingulate cortex which um, is the hub for for managing all that. And it's also the hub for uh, willpower, essentially resisting temptations. And Mm -hmm. so that part of the brain gets fatigued after just 15 minutes of intensive use. And suddenly we're asking ourselves to head down a buffet line and make a good decision or we're at work and we're hungry and there's a vending machine down the hall. And so we just fall into the willpower gap all the time. And so basically the point I'm making in the book is it's not really the case that people are are unclear what they should be eating. Like everyone knows that they should be having, you know, oatmeal and blueberries and ground flax seeds for breakfast, you know, and not, um, you know, Pop-Tarts. Like everyone's <laughs> clear. Like if you give people a flashcard test of like, should you be eating this food or not? Like, you know, broccoli, yes. Pizza, no. Like we know, right? It's I was not- just going to say- <laughs> I was just going to say back in the old days when there was phone books, pizza had its own, it was the only food that had its own category in the phone, (laughs) in the phone book. (laughs) I'm dating myself, but I I wanted to talk about decision fatigue because like you're making decisions all day at work with the, and then you come home with the kids. I mean, just a trip to the grocery store. I don't know how many times I've been to like Costco or the grocery store and come home and like ordered pizza. Because you get the fuckets, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm wiped out. And I see this also as it relates to, you know, um, like alcohol use disorder. A lot of times people struggle because at the end of the day, they have the, des- I deserve thing yeah. and all your willpower is gone. And then it just starts that uh, really yeah. bad process. Um, yeah, so let's, thank you. let's just hold there for just a quick second. The I deserve part is an indulger part. And it's trying to, that part of us is trying to help us. It's trying to alleviate mm. stress. It's trying to make us happy. Yeah, And so it's really worth thinking, um, what is true indulgence look like? What does true nourishment look like? What does true comfort look like? Right. Because really alcohol and food are a poor proxy for true comfort. Yeah. And so having some good things on hand, whether, you know, I mean, everyone's different, whether it's a good book or a bubble bath or, you know, going to, you know, uh, hit a bucket of balls at the golf course. I mean, everyone's different, right? right but right. knowing what really would would be nourishing to your system when you're depleted is an important thing to know. That That's a really good point. Um, let's talk a little bit about the differences between insatiable hunger and overpowering cravings. Um, what, what are the kind of the highlights of, of those two? um, Yeah. So insatiable hunger is what some of us have experienced. It sounds like maybe not you, Arlena, you sound like someone who gets full when you eat, if you eat kind of the right amount of food, you, you get full and then you don't want any more food. It's like not that hard. I read to, in your book where you were talking eating. about like you were binging and then you you were still hu- like you still, still hungry, still yeah. hungry. And I was like, yeah, it's not possible. Yeah. So, so someone with binge eating disorder experiences, uh, starting off a meal hungry, um, bite after bite, after bite, after bite, getting less hungry. And then midway through the meal, it turns so that then bite after bite, after bite, they start getting more and more hungry again. So they end the meal almost as hungry as they were when they started the meal. And a lot of people these days are experiencing just not getting full, just not getting full, maybe ever. Like they, they eat a big meal, they sit on the couch watching TV. And now they're like, I want some chips. So they eat a bag of chips. And then they're like, maybe some ice cream. So they start eating ice cream. They can finish off the ice cream, like just literally not getting full. And so this is a failure of, of a hormone. It's the hormone that makes us feel full. It's also the hormone that makes us feel like exercising and moving our bodies. Interestingly. So those of us who are, who are really sedentary, uh, are what's happening is our brain isn't seeing this hormone anymore. And the hormone is called leptin. And it was Mm -hmm. named for the Greek word leptos for thin. And leptin is the hormone that, that keeps your body weight in check. And it's, it's running amok in society these days. Obviously, Mm -hmm. you know, if you look out there at deer, for example, you never see obese deer, 
<laughs> it just no. doesn't exist, right? No. Um, and what's happening is what when the deer find, you know, a bunch of grass to eat and they eat and eat and eat, mm. they they maybe put on a tiny little bit of fat, adipose tissue, mm-hmm. which releases leptin which circles back to the brain that says, you don't need to eat anymore. Now it's time to get active and use that fuel to find a new patch of grass, to find a mate, to, you know, secure your shelter, Mm -hmm. whatever they have to do. Right. And so the, it's the feedback mechanism that shuts off the eating and turns on the movement. And our brains aren't seeing leptin because leptin is being blocked. It's being blocked by high inflammation high insulin and high triglycerides. Insulin is is the biggie. So high baseline okay. insulin levels, but also new research since I published that book, high high uh, inflammation in the hypothalamus of the brain oh. and high okay. triglycerides also. But it doesn't matter really because all three of those things are basically the result of eating too much sugar and flour. So the result, the, okay. the, 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 uh, okay. the solution is still the same. Stop eating sugar and flour. Yeah. I, I find, um, I find that understanding like the mechanics almost takes the guilt and shame out of it for me. Totally. Because then it's not, it's and you not, don't even have this moral... problem. Imagine how it feels for someone who actually has the problem of continuing to eat, be like ha- carrying a lot of excess weight and then eating long mm-hmm. into the night and feeling terrible about it, right? Yeah, yeah it does yeah. really help when you understand how the brain is is hijacked. Yeah, I don't have the um, eating disorder part, but I have the drug and alcohol part. And I, I recognize that when I understood the mechanics of my addiction, it did sort of take the moral meaning out of it. Like I didn't assign to myself that, oh, I'm, you know, shame is not... I did something wrong. Shame is I am wrong. Like I'm fundamentally right. broken, which is something that you address too. So just the concept of understanding the mechanics really was, I found so compassionate and I, and that, that was kind of the tone that I got from the whole book was this, I just wanted to throw that out there. It was very compassionate, like understanding the mechanics, um, overpowering cravings. Now, look, I understand the cravings. I don't know what happened to my body, but like <laughs> between I'm, I'm almost 55, but, be, you know, after 45 in the last 10 years, I suddenly understand like what sugar, like we have this cookie thing at our house. It's like, I can't even buy the Ghirardelli chocolate chips. Otherwise we go down the rabbit hole for like a few weeks. <laughs> I, <can't, laughs> just, I just can't do that. So I like the idea. I mean, the overarching message to me was there's some abstinence in there, mm-hmm. you know, the abstinence of flour and sugar. And I do very well with, you know, uh, structure like bright that. lines. Yeah. yeah. Like the no alcohol, it's a bright line. It's a clear it's a boundary. A clear you boundary. know where you stand. It's like my boundary with cigarettes. I cannot have a drag of a cigarette. If I have a drag of a cigarette, I'm smoking a pack tonight and, and puking <laughs> like, so zero, zero tolerance <laughs> yeah. policy is really important for certain substances. You I know? feel like those of us that have a high consequence like that, it's almost easier to adhere to abstinence. I mean, I mean, and for a variety of reasons, because you don't have that cognitive load either of wrestling with like willpower. I'm very clear. Alcohol is not my friend or neither is cocaine or weed, but that's <laughs> <laughs> not sure. I went them. back to cigarettes five and a half years ago and I went back and forth on them like five or six times over the Brutal. course of a year. And each time it was that lie of, I'll just have one. I would go to a meeting and everyone would oh, be smoking outside the meeting. I'll just have one. And and uh, then I'd be smoking, hiding, sneaking, you know, having bathing, to sneak. brushing. But yeah, yeah. Sneak in the back of my house, throw my Change clothes in the washing machine, you know, shower, brush my teeth before hi to my family. Yeah. Your right husband's there. like, you are fooling no one. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, and I'm not kissing you, you know, just so you know, because I still see, I know you brush your teeth, but I still smell it. You smell it. Like yeah. Anything. Because it's coming from your lungs. You can't yeah. brush your lungs as far as I know. Um, okay. So, uh, but the overpowering cravings, you talk about the nucleus accumbens, the pleasure center. Um, oh no, that's not true. It, well, pleasure reward motivation, and it, that's activated by dopamine. Yeah. Tell me what down regulation is. I mean, I already know what it is, but tell me. Yeah. Anyway. So cravings, this is important for anyone with yeah, cravings. Uh, alcohol, drug addiction. You got to understand that 
dopamine down regulation is the core of all of that, right? So what happens is we drink some Jack Daniels, we snort a rail of cocaine, we eat a donut, we watch some pornography, we pull a slot machine and win, right? Any of those things creates a flood of dopamine in the mesolimbic reward pathway, the nucleus accumbens. It's this little circuit in the brain that that if, that is the circuit that is designed to make sure that we prioritize getting food, getting sex, um, getting comfort and security. It it makes sure that we seek and find what we need to seek and find on a regular basis. Now that flood of dopamine is going to be fine uh, as long as you keep getting it. But what it's going to do over time is it's going to thin out the dopamine receptors. That's down regulation. Now, when the receptors become less numerous, less responsive, now you're only okay if you're eating donuts, watching pornography, smoking cigarettes, right? What drinking alcohol, whatever it is. Um, and this is why cross addiction is so common because once you put down alcohol, well, now you've got to drink a lot more coffee and, and smoke cigarettes to make up for some of that dopamine depletion. And you better go find someone cute to have sex with as well. Right. And you eat some cookies and eat some cookies. Exactly. <laughs> Hence AA meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Isn't that crazy? We offer coffee. Yeah. And there's, I, I hear yeah. there's coffee, coffee, but we're not drinking. But we're not drinking. But yeah. you want to go behind the barn over there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, oh, there, that's why there's so many programs. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I appreciate the, you know, I, I did, um, I did all my nursing prerequisites and didn't go to nursing school, but I learned about like the down regulation was so fascinating to me because it was like a cell, like, you know, that has these little funnels on the surface of the cell, right? Those are your receptors. A receptor is like a funnel that allows the dopamine to enter the cell. And when your cell is like, this is, this is too much, the funnels disappear or they not disappear altogether, but they downregulate, meaning they, they, they're actually, I was like, wow, the body is so smart that it can, that it can do that, but it takes away some of the funnels. So not as much. And that, ex, that ex, sort of explained why we needed more dopamine to yeah. have the same high. So you don't get high. Yeah. So you need more, more alcohol, drugs, sugar, sex, um, yeah. more, more barns, <laughs> <laughs> more, bar, more pizza. So that, that makes perfect sense. So the, the cravings, um, they are overpowering. So, but, uh, I do want to ask you about emotional eating and, you know, eating cues, emotions, and can you tell the Niagara Falls story with your daughter and the snack? Yeah. So, all right. So here's the story. My youngest daughter, Maya, um, was about two or three years old. And I had a friend visiting from out of town. She was actually from out of the country. She was from Australia. And we drove together with my daughter, Maya, uh, to Niagara Falls. I don't know where my other two kids were. I guess they were in daycare or something. Anyway, so it's just the three of us. We drive to Niagara Falls. We go for a long walk. It's a beautiful day. We have a great time. And now it's time to get in the car and go home. Well, Maya does not want to go home. So I've picked her up and I'm trying to click her into the car seat in the back seat. Which is super fun. <laughs> She's arching her back <laughs> yeah. and like using all four of her limbs to physically brace herself to not allow herself to be clicked into the car seat. But I'm going to win and I'm going to shove her pelvis <laughs> down into that car seat and click her shoulders in. <laughs> And, and I do, I click her in and she's screaming bloody murder. <laughs> she does not want to go home. And what my friend does is she goes into Maya's little diaper bag uh, thing and grabs a little baggie of bunny crackers and raisins and throws it over onto Maya's lap. Um, and uh, I grab the bunny cracker and raisins and and like put them back in the bag and I get in the car and I start the car. And I take a couple deep breaths. Were you pissed? No, I was oh. not. I was oh. just, I was just decompressing <laughs> from the, I was just decompressing from the whole thing. Right. Yeah. That's I mean, traumatic. Just a lot Trying of screaming. Maya's still screaming. When yeah. Maya calms down, I say to my friend, are you open to me offering you some feedback? And she said, yeah, she was in recovery too, you know? And, and I said, Maya is angry because she doesn't want to go home. And she's screaming and she's upset. And you just offered her crackers and raisins. 
And I said, you do that often enough and you'll teach her that what soothes your emotional upset is food. And I don't want to teach her that lesson. So I took the crackers away. She's not hungry. She's pissed. <laughs> yeah, she was the one who was pissed. So I just think, you know, lots of cues trigger us to eat. Sights, mm-hmm. sounds, smells, times of day, emotions. Emotions are one of the major cues to eat. And a lot of us were taught as kids that the solution to emotional disturbance is food. Yeah. And it's something we have to unlearn. It really is. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And, and, and so we're kind of transitioning into some of the solutions. I know everyone's going to be like, okay, well, what do I eat? Everyone wants to know what the food plan is, which is why you so cleverly at chapter six, have that little block that says, if you just jumped to chapter six, (laughs) go back and read the mechanics of why all this shit is happening in the first place. (laughs) Yeah, it does matter to know the why. It does matter. And the reality is Bright Line Eating is not a food plan. Can you get the food plan in the book? You can. Yeah. Um, But um, we've revised it since then, first of all. So the latest, the most updated food plan is only available in our Bright Line Eating boot camp um, or in the 14-day challenge. Um, But the important thing is that diets don't work, right? It's only going to work if right. you work a full program of recovery around it. If you really yeah. do it wholeheartedly, which is, you know, the best way to do that is, is in our program. We have an online yeah. program. We have, you know, thousands of people in this online community. The Bright Line Eating Bootcamp is the, is the 10 week program that really teaches you how to do it. It's not the kind yeah. of thing you can just do on your own. Um, it takes, I mean, for most people, some people. Yeah. Have. I mean, we're talking about, changing the way we're, we're rewiring the brain it's behavior change there's there's a lot of things going on there and yeah. they're having the support in a variety of ways and we're going to talk about tools maybe we should start talking about tools pretty soon there was but there was a couple of things um uh, i wanted to talk about first now i'm forgetting what it is i'm gonna have to edit this part <laughs> um shoot Okay. Well, let's talk, let's just talk about the tools. Cause everyone wants to know, like, what am I supposed to eat? And the truth of the matter is when I read this, it wasn't like, Oh, you know, it wasn't like, Oh my God, I didn't know that I was supposed to, you know, like there was nothing shocking about it. Right. So it's not, you're right. It's not about the diet. It's not about it, but it seemed like all the other stuff that you added in the section. Okay. So chapter tools was about the 10, obviously you know, what to eat is important and and the structure was important and the bright lines are important. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. I thought what was also really interesting, I think this is why most people listen, I don't, I don't know, this is not my area of expertise, but that it's the support around getting your first, um, I think I read somewhere in the book that it takes between don't tell me (laughs) <laughs> that it takes between 66 days, like between 18 and 254 days to build a habit, to now, build a for, habit, for a habit to become automatic. And now that's one new behavior. So this was a study where they had people start one new behavior. Like let's say yeah. drink a glass of water upon awakening. And then they had to report in every day. Did it feel automatic to do that? Did you do it automatically? Uh, and it took between 18 and 254 days for one new action to become automatic. But with bright line eating, you're changing all kinds of actions, right? Uh, you're changing how you eat breakfast, how you eat lunch, how you eat dinner, how you don't even eat in between the tools that you use. And so there's a lot of new things and you're breaking probably an addiction to sugar and flour. So uh, it it's, you, you want to assume that it's going to take several months to make the whole system feel automatic. Oh, uh, that, that was a, a good point. Um, you were talking about when you first are breaking a habit, um, in the book, you talk about this period of flatness, you know, mm. like, Oh, am I, am I, am I going to like this food? And, yeah. you know, you talk about the, you know, you're down regulated. It takes a minute for your brain to heal your brain to heal your taste buds, every place. Every, did you say every two weeks, is every two weeks, every single cell in your taste buds is dead and born fresh. Yeah. Every dead two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I your related that really fast. 
That's amazing. I, I related that to like drug and alcohol because when people quit and you're downregulated, it takes a minute for your receptors to return. That's right. And, and everything and so, feels kind of bleak for a little while. Yeah. yeah. So I think if people know, it's like, Hey, when you first start this life is going to feel flat, maybe food tastes flat for a minute, you know, but it will change. That's right. I think that's the overarching message. Is Absolutely. That your and brain I love heal. my food. I mean, bright line eating is not about depriving yourself of good food. I mean, the foods that we, first of all, we eat every whole real food. I mean, if like, if you've ever tried paleo or keto, bright line eating is way less restrictive than right. those plans. Yeah. Um, those plans don't include any sugar or flour either, by the way. Um, right. You know, I like everyone says you shouldn't be eating pop tarts, right? Like let's get, or, you know, waffles, you know, like white flour waffle, like everyone knows you should not be eating that. Um, but in bright line eating, you eat every whole real food, like every whole real food in That's a balance amazing. of, you yeah. know, like kind of the, really the way the the body was designed to run with food. Um, and you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which again is sort of, it creates a rhythm of the day. It's, it's a brilliant plan. It restores a lot of balance. It restores your circadian rhythm balance, you start to yeah. sleep better. Um, yeah. And some people are balanced naturally with their food. I mean, not everybody needs bright line eating. Bright line eating is not for everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm going to rattle off some tools and then I have a few questions I want to ask you. I wanted to ask you about weight loss drugs. Do you, do you have a hard stop that I need to be aware of? We have a, nope. Oh, I good. Not. Okay. Yeah, I have so many can. more. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> we can talk away. <laughs> okay. So some of the tools that you mentioned are daily rituals, morning routines, inspirational reading, meditation. Meditation was one of those things that you listed that replenishes willpower. I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. along with, um, would you say prayer, prayer, uh, connection, yeah, prayer, with friends, meditation, social support, social yeah. support. Yeah. There were so many things that restore and gratitude. Willpower. Gratitude. Yeah. I mean, listen, these are all starting to sound familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when things work, they work. Um, committing to your food. Um, evening yeah, this routine. Is a thing that's so different important. in bright line eating than other food plans is we write down our food the night before what we're going to uh, eat for the next day. Girl, that is one of my toughest. We, we are vulnerable in the evening. Now I know why, you know, the willpower gap. I was like, Oh, okay. This is all starting to make a lot of sense. Um, because we don't plan ahead. Yep. And if then you plan it the night before when you're all full from dinner and your yeah. brain is got some good glucose on board, uh, you can sit the, there's the will, the willpower gap is sort of abated at that time you've you've just eaten you've rested now you look in the fridge and you say okay what should we have for for food tomorrow and you mm. just write it down usually breakfast and lunch are pretty routinized they're kind yeah. of automatic mm -hmm. uh, and then you but you're thinking what are we going to do for dinner tomorrow night and just making that decision and jotting it down at the time just makes it automatic the next day to start prepping yeah. that meal at that time so you're not <laughs> ordering a pizza <laughs> yeah or going to we're going out for taco Tuesday. It's Tuesday as we're recording this. <laughs> we have a little taco addiction. Um, I want to be skinny, but I like tacos. You've seen those memes, I'm sure. Um, okay, so you have an uh the nightly checklist sheet. Brilliant. I thought that was so helpful. I'm totally gonna utilize that. You have an emergency action plan, mastermind, uh, mastermind groups and buddies, accountability is super good. And I love that you have a whole mastermind call structure. For someone who is like, I don't even know what that is. There's a whole outline provided in the book. Um, let's talk a little bit about waste, weight loss drugs. Because I, you know, when we first talked, I was like, yeah, I lost 20 pounds off weight loss drugs. And so now I'm going on like four months. I only fluctuate, you know, uh, like three or four pounds. Is um, this you? No. This is me. Yeah. This is you. you. So you tried weight loss drugs. You lost 20 pounds. Yeah. And so it's been about four months. And so if I you're off them now, I'm off them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I lost 20 pounds. I also lost half my hair. I would say my mm. hair is yeah brutal. And is that I was why you stopped taking them? Uh, well, I hit my goal weight and, and then I was like, I guess I'm done. Um, I didn't find out till afterwards. I was watching, um, uh, I was on TikTok or something and this lady was selling a hair care product. She was, it was, it was addressing like the flyaways you get from hair breakage after bariatric surgery. 
Mm. And I was like, and she goes, Oh, I lost a bunch of hair because after my bariatric surgery, I wasn't eating enough protein or she wasn't eating well. So she was basically malnourished and made her hair fall out. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> I guess that's what yeah. I did. Right. So that, that was a super bomb. That was a bummer. My hair is super long, but now is um, long and thin. So I don't want to end up being like one of those scary witches that have long, thin hair. So I, <laughs> I'm very vain. Anyways, um, what would you say? Like, so it worked okay for me because I'm probably, you know, on the quiz, what is it, the susceptibility scale? I'm, I think I'm probably low on that. So maybe this is, but if you are not low on the susceptibility scale, what is the implication of weight loss, weight loss drugs after you quit? Uh, well, research shows you gain all the weight back. So weight wow. loss drugs only make sense if you're going to be on them forever. Yeah. And that means, you know, just the ability to weather any side effects you end up getting and to be able to pay for them. So in, Oh my God, it was expensive too. Yeah. It was so, not cheap. Yeah. That's what research shows is the weight comes roaring right back as soon as you stop the drugs. Yeah. That's brutal. Um, Okay. So that's good to know. Uh, I like how you have a lot of contingency plans. Like everybody is like, what do I do around the holidays? What am I supposed to do? And I travel like, these are all, um, problems I think that are pretty common. How do you, yeah. how do you solve for those types of things? Totally. Well, it's all solvable. I mean, I've traveled around the world many times. I moved to Australia and back doing <laughs> this plan. I've, you know, traveled to the Middle East and to Europe and, you know, all around the world doing this. And um, it takes some planning ahead, but it's very, very doable. For the holidays, it's interesting. You know, I treat Thanksgiving as a Thursday food wise. I literally eat what I always eat, which is, you know, dinner's going to be four ounces of protein, you know, six ounces of cooked vegetable, you know, eight ounces of salad, blah, blah, blah. Like it's going to be the same, you know, I mean, yeah, I might have turkey for my protein, but um, what I've found is that in Brightline eating, we bring so much of the real meaning of the holidays back into our mm. hearts and minds as the center mm. point. Thanksgiving, for example, is about gratitude and service. Thanksgiving. Mm. I mean, it even tells you that in the name, right? And so the way you get through Thanksgiving is you focus on the people and you really show up to be of service. And you realize through doing this, that food is is a poor proxy for connection. You know, just being face down, shoveling it in with 12 other people around the table who are shoveling it in is actually not connecting, you know? Um, and, and so- it takes like 10 minutes. You spend like <laughs> 12 hours cooking and it, it takes like 10 minutes to eat. Yeah, yeah. And then the rest of the time you you watch football and mess play around. <laughs> yeah. So you play with the kids, you refill glasses, you do dishes, you peel potatoes, you smile, you uh, ask people what's new in their world, what's got their attention in life yeah. these days, and you really show up to the day. And, you know, I haven't eaten sugar or flour on Thanksgiving in a long time. And I got to say, Thanksgiving is the warmest, mm. uh, most wonderful holiday. Bright. It's brighter. It's this brighter. Way. I love that. That's great. Um and what about hormones and menopause? How do hormones, I, I was uh, um, doing some research in this, that I, you know, I'm in menopause and there is a, a lady that I the follow on social media, who's a um, OBGYN. She's like a double board certified. She did this whole thing about how calories in calories out for menopausal women doesn't really address the visceral fat. I guess she gets a lot of criticism from like these um, gym bros who are like, they don't really treat women differently after menopause. What is, what is your perspective on how hormones affect things like visceral fat? Yeah. So what happens with menopause and this actually happens for menopause as well. So <laughs> what is, is estrogen tanks and uh, estrogen uh, actually facilitates the effectiveness of insulin. So insulin is our fat storage oh. and fat release hormone. And without enough estrogen around, 
now you've got a problem because the body's storing more visceral fat. It's not using glucose properly. You're more prone mm -hmm. to weight gain around the middle and so forth. So I published a study a couple of years ago where we looked at, I think it was four over 4,000 people who'd done bright line eating. And they ate, they ranged in age from 18 to 80. And we looked at the amount of weight that they lost just in the first eight weeks. In the first eight weeks, people's weight loss on average was 15 to 17 pounds. And that stayed consistent and true, whether they were 18 or 80. Uh, we saw no difference, no statistically significant difference at all in weight loss between women in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, it didn't matter, completely no difference. And the reason is that when you stop eating sugar and flour, you're not taxing your blood glucose and insulin systems the way you are when you're eating sugar and flour. So if you go on some diet where let's say you're doing one point brownies and you know, you're gaming the system like that, well, th that's fine. You're keeping within your caloric intake or whatever, but you're also relying on insulin to clean up your mess. And without estrogen on board, it's not gonna be able to do as good a job and you're gonna keep storing the fat. So it, uh, weight loss is harder after menopause unless you're doing bright line eating. Unless you're doing bright line eating. Um, do, you, do you encourage people to talk to their doctors about estrogen uh, hormone replacement therapy? Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm, I have had a wicked perimenopause. I'm kind of right hovering in the place of uh, like, my periods haven't completely stopped, but I haven't had one in like six months. And before that it was six months. And before that it was six months. So I'm kind of, I'm like the car that's like, <coughs> <laughs> before it dies. You are side sputtering of the out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was going nuts. I wasn't sleeping. I, my Brutal. moods were all over the place. I yeah. felt pregnant. Like I was just a mess. <laughs> And um, I am now on bioidentical hormones, a little yeah. bit of estrogen, a little bit of progesterone and a little bit of testosterone, a yeah. little bit of all three every yeah. day, bioidentical. And it's yeah. like a miracle for me. So yeah, I definitely yeah. encourage people to talk to their doctors and just do, just do what feels right for you. But that's, what's been working for me. And I'm very happy with it. Yeah. Can I just tell you that I uh, did the bioidentical hormones life-changing for a variety of reasons, libido, sleep. Libido. Oh my God. I was dead from the neck down for a period of time. <laughs> my poor yeah. husband. Yeah, I was like, Oh seriously. my God, is it that time again? <laughs> seriously. You know, and it really brought me back to life, but it has helped me, uh, help me lose weight too. I think because, uh, of all the reasons you just mentioned, I want to ask you, is there anything that we, that I didn't ask you that we probably should cover? I kind of glossed over the the food plan and I know everyone's going to be like, I just want to know what I'm supposed to eat. Is there you anything know, that we missed? I think, um, we publish our data and I think, uh, you don't, you don't find published data on most weight loss programs because every program kind of has the same trajectory where people lose weight initially and then they plateau out and then they regain it. And that's, you know, whether you're doing keto or paleo or, you know, yeah. any, you know, Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or, you know, basically any program, that's what the research shows. And in Brightline Eating, we've published studies in the Journal of Nut Nutrition and Weight Loss showing that first of all, people who do bright line eating lose way more weight initially than on any other program. Um, actually, interestingly, the equivalent amount of weight to weight loss drugs, the semaglutide drugs, people lose and, that and much surgery? weight on bright line eating. And the weight um, loss surgery? So with weight loss surgery, weight loss surgery results are kind of interesting. What, what typically doesn't happen with weight loss surgery is getting down to goal weight. Bright line eating really aims to get all the excess weight off of people. Weight loss surgery tends to leave people still living with obesity. Um, just, you know, maybe not extreme morbid obesity, but obesity. And so, and, and by the way, the, uh, cross addiction, I know plenty of people who, uh, started drinking heavily after bariatric surgery. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. I actually have a friend who was on the podcast a long time ago, Chris, he and his sister had the same weight problem. They both had bariatric surgery. They both started drinking heavily, but Chris's wife was like, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to divorce you. So he went to a 12 step program and he got sober his sister did not, and she died. 
I mean, it's so, it's very like what we're talking about in general is addiction, whether it's food, drugs, alcohol, and, and that really needs to be addressed, you know? And that's the thing is that the surgery doesn't address that. It, it it can seem at first like it does, because I think there's something about the severing of the neurons down in the gut. And of course there is this nervous system Mm -hmm. in the gut, um, that can alleviate some of the food addiction initially, but all those neurons regrow, those connections regrow. And before you know it, people are gaining weight again after, after weight loss surgery. And it's really, and then you sort of feel like, well, now I've ruined my digestive system. I can't eat vegetables yeah. very well. I can't eat full meals very well. I'm not absorbing nutrients very well. And and now I'm gaining weight again. What do I do? So, um, yeah. So it feels like a classic case of, um, you know, it's a symptom of a deeper issue. Right. And what I really liked about bright line eating is that it, it, um, you know, it's not trauma therapy or anything like that, but it did have all the elements that you find, you know, the IFS, the uh, positive psychology and 12 step. It's really a, a beautiful combination of all those things with the practical, you know, science and data to sort of, um, not make this a moral issue. Oh, uh, maybe what else? One thing I wanted to talk about was breaking bright lines. Like Uh how do we, how do we be compassionate towards ourselves? Nobody's going to be able to do this perfectly. So what happens when people break their bright lines? Well, well, I have a whole book that's on that. It's called resume resume Ah. and resume are it's, we spell it R E Z O O M because you want (laughs) to Uh, zoom back fast. Got it. Uh, and um, yeah, in bright line eating, we really sort of have a whole culture around the resume uh, because yeah, people slip and not everybody slips. Some people just like day one babies come into AA and stay right, sober stay from sober their forever. first meeting. We see that in bright line eating too, but for a lot of people, some amount of relapse is going to be part of their story. And so we talk about simply resuming and we give people real concrete tools for doing that. We call them the four S's. Oh, so yes. speed is the first one. Um, come back fast, resume fast. The second one is social support. Talk about it because there's so much shame that comes up when you oh, deviate. Yeah. And then uh, it's so helpful to talk about it with other people and to get support. Maybe commit your food to someone for a little while on the phone accountability, each day, yeah. get some accountability. So speed, social support, self-compassion. Big. So understand that the part of you that picked that food up was really trying to help. It was trying to make things easier or better or happier or more comforting or more exciting. And, you know, that part just needs some attention. It needs some better strategies, you know, for helping to make you happy. Um, speed, social support, self-compassion, seek the lesson is the last S. Seek mm-hmm. the lesson. And we give actually in the book, Bright Line Eating, we give... 10 questions to ask yourself called the permission to be human action plan. Oh, I love that. And so it's a little journaling exercise you can do after a break uh, where you can uh, learn from it. And so uh, I, I mean, my story with drugs and alcohol is one and done. I put down the drugs and alcohol 29 years ago. I put them down and I've never picked them up again with food. It's not been that way. I mean, I think since I first really, landed in food recovery 20 years ago. Um, I've, I've been abstinent probably 94% of the days. I think I counted up once, you know, (laughs) and my, my, you know, the current streak I'm on is four years without sugar and flour. Um, but it has not been perfect. And I've spent plenty of time face down in the ditch, um, with food, you know, knowing what to do, but just not doing it. And, it's a hard place to be. Food is the hardest. And actually yeah. in the book resume, I talk about all the reasons why food is the hardest addiction to kick. I really think it's the hardest, not because it's a stronger addiction in the brain. It's not, um, it's, you know, right in there with, you know, cigarettes, cocaine, it's, it's about equivalent. Um, but nothing is like food when it comes to the difficulty of the social environment. Oh, uh, brutal. Yeah. We are bombarded. We are bombarded with food choices constantly. Like you can't drive down the street without seeing 50 different kinds of restaurants or fast food or. Yeah. I mean, mean, when I stopped smoking crack, it's true. Totally. When I stopped smoking crack, I had a whole universe 
to return to where nobody was inviting me to smoke crack. Nobody <laughs> wanted me to smoke crack. There were no billboards or signs or logos around my crack cocaine addiction. I could basically step into a world back in normal society that was almost entirely free of cues around my addiction. Yeah. Whereas someone with a food addiction is drowning in a sea of cues and, and ridiculous amounts of social pressure. I mean, ridiculous. just at my house the other day, and if, you know, everyone knows I do bright line eating and blah, 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 but just wrote at my the, house damn the other day, um, all, all kinds of family were around and um, it was my daughter, Maya. She's been featured in this podcast now. It was Maya's 12th birthday. And she'd made this cake, this like layered, it was cookie cake on the bottom and oh. then layered with real cake and then ice cream cake and then I, more layers. And it was this massive thing. And most of the grandparents had a slice, you know, one of them didn't. And someone in my dining room started to haze her a little bit. Come on. You, you like basically the, you only live once thing. Like, you know, oh, it's not that's really insidious. And I was in the kitchen. I, it would have been rude for me to come out and basically say like, hey. not in my house, you know, yeah. like, really, you're going to do that here. You're going to give someone a hard time for saying no, thank you to cake. Like, think about what the f- you're doing. Like, yeah, but it really is. You can't go anywhere without someone pressuring you to eat foods that you don't really need to be eating. It's right. ridiculous. Yeah. I, I, we, we get that with alcohol too. People are, I mean, they drink it at church for heaven's sakes, <laughs> <laughs> but some churches, yeah. I suppose, yeah. but, um, yeah, you know, food, food is brutal. It's everywhere. And, and, and uh, it, it's tough to, but if you're clear about your bright lines and you have severe consequences, I suppose, you know, there's a lot of variables like where you fall in the, uh, on the food quiz. What was yours? What I forgot to ask you. Oh, what I'm was a 10. Your... I'm a 10 plus, <laughs> plus, 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 plus. Like I think, what does it say in spinal tap? I think I go to 11, you know, like, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm, tap. I'm beyond a 10. Like the questions are things like, um, you know, uh, how much time have you spent, you know, when your food, when your eating is at its worst, um, what's your thinking about what you've eaten or not eaten on your plan or off your plan? Like how much time are you spending thinking about that? And my answer is when my food is at its worst, I'm thinking about almost nothing else. Like that is all I can think about is my food and my weight and, and all that. And, uh, you know, when my food is at its worst, when I start to eat, I completely lose, lose control over how much I eat. I cannot stop eating. Yeah. Um, that's addiction. Yeah really, really bad. Lose the power of choice. Yeah. Well, listen, um, this has been, I've learned so much. Something else. Yeah. Yeah. My new book. We haven't mentioned my new book. I haven't talked about it the whole time. Oh, my new book, not my first this, Right. On this bright day. My new book. Oh my gosh. (laughs) On this bright day. That's okay. That's okay. I would I have, have forgotten too, it. except it's sitting right here. And then we I almost like, forgot oh, wait, about it. There, there is something. So <laughs> the, it, it publishes October 24th and you can pre-order oh, okay. a copy and get an I have incredible a galley bonus copy. pack. You have a galley copy? Oh, I sweet. Do. This yeah. is the real copy. It's so pretty. Look it's how pretty beautiful. This is. It's yeah. No, book. I, and I, and I've, I've been reading it and it's so thoughtful and it's so encouraging and it does, um, feed into that feed maybe feed isn't the right word but it does, <laughs> it does support the whole idea of starting like setting your intention for the day right Being conscious and intentional about setting your intention for the day asking for help and uh, providing yourself with some compassionate support yeah yeah so it's, it's a really daily beautiful. meditation reader and it's the only one i know you have people who listen who are 12 step diehards, but you might have some people who also, you know, um, some things about the 12 steps aren't exactly the right fit or whatever. I have some, I have some 12 step haters, which is why I'm writing the book. (laughs) (laughs) So I want to say there are, there, there's like a, a, a 12 step food daily reader, but it's very God and 12 step based. right? Right. And this one is, um, it's free it's, of that. Dogma. It is. It is. I mean, you know, and so it's going to start you with inspiration and aspiration, but also there's some entries that are a little more sciencey, mm-hmm. um, you know, with inspiration and aspiration. But like when we talk about sleep and circadian rhythm, and so you're going to learn stuff through it. It's very psychologically based. 
Um, I love me some science. Yeah, it's just a sweet book. When you don't have faith, we have science. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I am a person of faith um, very strongly. So, but there's ways to talk about it, right? That aren't laden with a specific approach, you know? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for remembering to talk about on this book. bright day, a year of reflections for lasting food freedom. And if you want the amazing bonus package that's available, go to on this bright day book.com and you can download the bonuses. Who doesn't love a bonus? Yeah. There's like five of them. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So we have your boot camp coming up. The book is coming out. You've got some bonuses and definitely check out um, your first book that Earl, the bright line eating book as well. Yeah. I think, I think the boot camp registration is open, uh, like, like now I believe, and, and might be closing in just a few days. So if you listen to this podcast after too long, after it's released, it might be closed and you might have to wait till January 1st, but, uh, you might want to head right over to brightlineeating.com and check it out. Uh, Absolutely. you'll, you'll find everything you need there. Brightlineeating.com. Thank you so much. It's been amazing. Yeah. It's so sweet to get to know you a bit. My litter mate, my 19. I know we got the same year. You spent your first year in uh, in San Jose. I swear we were at some of the same meetings. We had to be Mm -hmm. because we were both going to meetings all the time that first year. (laughs) Yep. All the time. time. Well, congratulations on all your success. I, I will definitely be watching and paying attention. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. Thanks for having me, Arlena. So sweet to, to meet you and to get to know you. And bye, everyone. So good. Thanks for listening. So sweet Thanks. to be with you. Thanks for watching. Talk soon. Bye.